Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This 30-minute podcast features a new author interviewed by me every single day, 365 days a year for about 30 minutes. I am also the publisher for Zibby Books, which publishes 12 books a year in fiction and memoir. Our books are already out now. You can check it out on zibbybooks.com. And we have a magazine called Zibby Mag, where we have lots of wonderful essays and lifestyle features. That's at zibbymag.com. We have classes at zibbyclasses.com. And I recently opened a bookstore in LA called Zibby's Bookshop at 1113 Montana Avenue at 11th Street in Santa Monica. I hope that you are able to enjoy some of our other offerings. But this here podcast is the basis of all of it and started in 2018. And no matter what I do, this is basically my favorite thing. Enjoy. Holly Goldberg Sloan is the author of Pieces of Blue. She is also the author of seven books for young readers, which have been translated into 27 languages. Her novel, Counting by Sevens, was an E.B. White honor book and sold over a million copies. Also a noted feature film writer, Holly wrote the Disney blockbuster Angels in the Outfield, and she was the first woman to direct a live-action film for Disney, which she wrote and directed, The Big Green. The mother of two sons, Holly lives with her husband in Santa Monica, California. Pieces of Blue is her debut novel for adults. Welcome, Holly. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Pieces of Blue, your latest novel, and everything else about you. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I have watched your explosion, there's no other way to say it, onto the book scene. And the first thing I want to say that calling it Moms Don't Have Time to Read is brilliant. And if there's anything as a mom, and I have two adult sons, that you must do when you're raising them. (laughs) You must find time to read. Even if it's 20 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, you have to escape. And And I think television is an escape. It's wonderful. I write television. But there's something about reading where it activates your imagination. You get to be the casting director. You get to imagine what the set looks like. And it it's a more on you. And when you're a mom, you need to do that too. You can't just read, give a mouse a cookie. I mean, that's beautiful, but it's nice to make something that nurtures yourself as well. <laughs> Laura Numeroff was just in my store, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yes, that is good advice. I have found reading to be a sanity check for myself, you know, something that grounds me and can change my mood faster than anything else. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you. In your case, I'm going to say this, be careful what you wish for, because now you probably have stacks of books around you at all time that you either have to read or read the synopsis for. And the probably only vacation for you would be to go somewhere for a week and not read. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> a vacation would be like having a week to read a book would be really nice. Yes. <laughs> that would yeah. be really nice. The whole half hour a night thing. Yeah. Okay. Your book. Can you please tell listeners about your book, your latest book? My book? Yeah. Yes. We're recording it. It's a podcast, but we're also recording video. So I, I'm holding it up. Ooh, look, uh, it's, a, it's called Pieces of Blue. And it is my first novel intended for adult readers. I have a lot of adult readers. I have seven or eight other novels, but they were written primarily for young adults or a younger audience. My book, Counting by Sevens, has a very, very large adult readership. And so I never, I didn't, I don't understand even to this day (laughs) why a book is, is put in a certain category I guess I understand it a little bit more, but because I also write film and television, you don't do that with film and television. You wouldn't release a movie, for example, and say, you should go see this movie if you're in third grade and (laughs) sixth grade. And after (laughs) sixth grade, I don't know about the movie. It's because it costs too much money. And so everything has to have a broad appeal. And I think I wrote Angels in the Outfield and I wrote a movie called Made in America, and I wrote a movie called The Big Green, and I just try to get a wide audience. That's what we're sort of taught and told to do. So I think that about my books, I even think kids in high school would like Pieces of Blue, but what do I know? (laughs) Not the intended audience, intended audiences. I used to read all my mom's books growing up. I mean, who cares what the labels are, right? So did I. And my my dad gave me hideously inappropriate books as a child that says 
something about how he was picturing me. He always <laughs> saw me, even when I was very tiny, as just an adult in a very shrunken body. So <laughs> I couldn't understand many of the things, but he was a professor. He is a piece of life. And I wanted so much to connect to him. And that was the way we could connect. So mm. I read Catch-22. I don't know. I was eight, but <laughs> however old I was. Yes. So books connect us. I was reading Judith Krantz, like romance novels and all this stuff. That's like how I learned everything is <laughs> from all these like multi generational sagas of families and crises. <laughs> it's funny if you could say everything I, I know about life, I know from Judith Krantz. Yeah. It's so funny. <laughs> I know. I, probably somebody's written that book already, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think reading what our parents read or having them recommend things, you know, books are all about connection anyway. And I think that's one early way that big readers try to foster that same connection with your kids. If that's the way you know to connect with other people, it's like a shorthand, even if it might be the wrong book. Right, right. Exactly. Because it's sort of saying this is what we do at night in the dark. Or in the case of a kid that's kind of precocious, in the day when they're yelling at you, go outside and you nod and then just take your book and go back and sit on the couch and read. Was that, are you that precocious kid? Was that you? Well, I did love to read. I did like the outside too. So, but I grew up in Oregon primarily in Eugene, Oregon, and there's a lot of rain there. And it's funny the way we saw rain. We saw the rain the way Eskimos see snow, which is there are a hundred ways to say it's raining outside. Oh, it's only drizzling. Oh, it's spitting. We used to say, and my, my mom would always say, oh, that's vegetable mist. <laughs> come out of the sprayers. And at night, the weather person would be standing in front of the map saying so many different things. We will have showers in the morning, followed by <laughs> rain in the afternoon, drizzle in the nighttime. I mean, it was raining, but nobody could just say that. <laughs> living, so you had to parse it. But I think cold climates, climates with bad weather, I'm going to say as a generalization, foster readers. Interesting. Well, in your book, it starts off in the rain and in Oregon, and then off you go to, well, actually, I guess it starts as they just get to Hawaii. And it rains. And it, it rains. It rain. As yes. a, Hawaii has so much rain, has so much sun as well. But yes, I guess I am very con- it's funny how we don't really know the things that are our emotional connections, or maybe it takes some years of living, which I have, <laughs> to realize what they are. But I'm very, very attuned to the weather. And I live in Southern California now, and it rained 28 inches this year. And the regular rainfall is 13 inches. And so it actually was an incredible gift to all of us because we were in such extreme drought. But the modern condition is that no matter what happens, you complain. So pretty much everyone, we yeah. needed the rain so much. And then we got the rain. And now <laughs> we should be complaining about the rain. And the LA Times, every day, the headline, I pick it up every day. It's all about the rain in some form of catastrophe. The floods <laughs> are coming. The dams have broken. New lakes have appeared that were never there before. It's all about um, not to say that journalism is alarmism, but maybe that sells. I don't know. I In a podcast, is it alarmism? Should I think of something alarming? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's better. I'm on track of my book. I wrote a book. It's called Pieces of Blue. It starts in Portland, Oregon, and it's about a woman who has lost her husband and fell on pretty hard times and finally got her insurance money. And she took this money very capriciously, wasn't really thinking it through, didn't visit the place. She went online. She saw a piece of property slightly east of the North Shore of Oahu, and she buys a rundown motel and takes her three children and moves there. And where did that idea come from? Well, I have no imagination at all. <laughs> so everything... I, that I find that very hard to believe. Well, yes. I mean, yes and no. I can take any fact that's happened and embellish it and make it into fiction, which is alarming for people in my life. But <laughs> I had a friend, we were doing a movie together in Australia. We're in the van. When you're in the van, you sort of drive forever. It was in pre-production, I guess. And we're driving in the van and we're all talking. It's crazy how many intimate things you find out in a movie van. And this producer is the UPM as well. He told us that his father died very unexpectedly when he was young. It's funny, in my mind, I think that he was... When he was telling the story, I imagined him 10 or 11. And that's always what I thought he said. 
But recently I saw him and I think he said, I was 15. And (laughs) so every fact of his story, apparently I have not remembered (laughs) in the right way. But anyway, we're in the van. He says father died and his mom got some life insurance and she had two choices or in her mind, she had two choices. She could buy a boat and try to do charter salmon fishing, or she found a property in Hawaii and it was an old rundown motel. And when we're in the van, he says, my mom took the boat and was, we did salmon fishing and we didn't know how to salmon fish. We didn't even know how to drive the boat. We smashed the boat all the time. Oh no! He tells the story. And in my mind, and then he says, I believe he says, he now denies saying this. What if we had had the motel in Hawaii, the property? Think about what that'd be worth today. She made the wrong choice. And I said, but why did she do that? And he said, well, her family, everyone thought that the Hawaii choice was the risky choice. Mm. The salmon fishing, they were from the Pacific Northwest. They knew about salmon, I guess. I'm from the Pacific Northwest. So I heard that story and all I could imagine was, get the motel, get the motel. <laughs> so I then couldn't stop thinking about it. And I wrote about a woman whose husband dies unexpectedly. And she takes her children and moves to a place she knows nothing about. Now, here's the other part about that. We moved every three years when I was growing up. And my father's a professor. As I said, my mom is an architect. But my dad, he was a consultant to the Peace Corps. And then my dad was two times a Fulbright professor. So wow. I went to high school in Istanbul. And I went to grade school in Holland. And we moved. I My dad taught at Berkeley and we always went back. We had a home base and that was Eugene, Oregon, but we always went back. And so I think that I like the idea of what it means to be a new kid in school, what it means to be an adult in a really unfamiliar situation. So I think, again, I have no imagination. I'm just tapping into everything that I can either relate to or conjure. There are no dragons or vampires, or mermaids in the book, because I've never met those people. But maybe, (laughs) and therefore, I can only write contemporary realistic fiction. That's what I write. Okay. Well, I think that, I like to think that takes imagination. You know, a little bit. Just a smidge. Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. I like how in the book, you really have the kids who would typically be fighting and all of that. There's this one sort of poignant moment where they think about how much their dad would have loved where they arrived in Hawaii and how two of the kids sort of hold each other's hands in that moment. And you say something like the the son normally would have pulled away, but instead they like sat there holding hands and thinking about their dad. It was so sad. I mean, beautiful, but so poignant. Tell me more about like just this feeling of loss of young people and, um, you know, just loss in general and, and writing about it. Well, certainly that's somewhat of a theme in my work. In Counting by Sevens, a young girl, much younger, in this case, she's in grade school, she loses both of her parents in a car accident. And I'm exploring how we get over grief, how we get over loss. But I believe that loss is as fundamental as anything that we experience in life. And all of us will have loss. and you can't prepare for it, but you can work through it. And I think laughing and crying are so close. So I try to make my books funny. But then when I tell them, oh, it's about somebody whose parents, that kid who lost his parents, it's very funny. Then the people that I'm somehow deemed inappropriate. A Pieces of Blue is about loss, but it's also about found because life has so much balance to it. And it also starts out to be somewhat one kind of story, and it turns into a different kind of story. And that's a metaphor for me, which is life starts out as one thing, and it can take a turn into something else. And we don't, if we think that we know where it's all going, we're wrong. So Mm -hmm. the more we can not necessarily prepare for change, but at least embrace change, understand change, accept change. I'm not sure. Even the title, Pieces of Blue, that when you are looking out on the sky, sometimes there's clouds, but there is blue behind that. And you can see it sometimes when it's not even there, if you know Mm. it's there. You were talking about, you know, big 
life shifts and periods of change and all that, like which parts of your life did you not see coming? Like what was uh, something that sort of fundamentally shifted the course for you? Well, I I would say the first thing is my parents' divorce was a really big thing in my life. Mm -hmm. I was 18, but uh, it was still very impactful. And then my own subsequent divorce after 10 years of marriage, when I had young children and in both, well, when my own divorce, I had a sense of failure and I'm someone who's felt that they've not necessarily succeeded, but that I've done what was expected. I held up my end and I got divorced and my first husband, I'm remarried, very, very happily remarried. And for, I think, 27 years now. So my first husband was married to for 10 years, but we had a very successful divorce. That's the part I want to stress to myself, to anyone who would, wants to listen. Uh, my parents had a very unsuccessful divorce. I had a successful one, and my first husband ended up even at one point living across the street So because we the kids went back and forth, and we really were there together for them, I think, in a fundamental way. But my first husband, he had heart failure swimming in the ocean and he died um, very suddenly in the ocean. Now, I don't think it's giving anything away to say that the main character, Lindsay's husband, Paul, he dies swimming in the ocean. So once again, my lack of imagination. But my first husband was on an island. He was in the British Virgin Islands and he went out snorkeling and he had heart failure and died in the water. So I certainly uh, understand what it means to have someone be alive one day and not alive the next. When I was in college, my boyfriend and I had dinner with his father in New York and then we got in the car and we drove back he was going to Dartmouth and we got in the car. We drove to Dartmouth and we, we left really early in the morning. Now I'm not sure why, but we had a rental car and we left at six in the morning. And when we got to Dartmouth, the film professor, we both were in the film program. Um, I went to Wellesley, but I'd gone to Dartmouth for one year. And the head of the film program was sitting on the stairs in front and he wanted to talk to us and he took my boyfriend at the time inside and told him that his father had died of a heart attack at 51 after running around the reservoir in New York. So, Uh, so that was, that was actually the first real time that I understood that there can be life-changing moments that there is no preparation for. And there's only the before and the after, and there was the life before and the life after And what we do with that, how we still are able to find joy before and after in our lives. And so maybe those kind of things have led me to write about it. I particularly think that we get emotions out by writing and by reading. So Mm -hmm. I write and then people read, but I look for the positive in all my stories. I want there to be, maybe it's not saying happy endings because I want people to be bigger and better and find resolution and find ways to get by. And so I write about that. Well, well, thank you for sharing all of that. I want to say I'm sorry for your loss, but you say not to say you're sorry for the loss <laughs> in the book. So I'm not going to say that, but I am, I, I, I don't know. My heart goes out to you and him. Thank and- you. you know, I talk at schools a lot and I, I sometimes in the end, if I'm asked questions, sometimes a kid will say, why did, why did you write about that? Has anything happened like that in your own life? And then I will start to answer. I will answer. I was, yes, I've had some loss, unexpected loss. My first husband, we were divorced, but he died swimming in the ocean. And I'll be talking. And then I look up and I realize I'm slightly crying. And can I tell you this? There's nothing worse than doing that in front of kids. So then I have to do this weird smile, kind of like, Harry in succession after she sees what's <laughs> happened, where you've got this smile, you know, you look like an absolute crazy person um, because we are conditioned to have certain emotions and certain reactions. So one of the things 
when people say they're sorry for my loss, which I know is whatever my whatever that they're talking about. But when I say to someone else, I know it's that sincere and genuine, but it makes the other person, we're all characters in a play in a way, and they then can't just go on for their, they have to at least for one second step back and say, and become their serious self and say, thank you so much. And, because inappropriate for the, them to say, yeah, high five. You know, I mean, you have to, we're all role playing at all times. And the more maybe we understand that, maybe the more we don't just do stylized roles. We mm. find some authenticity in it. Part of the book, Pieces of Blue, that I am maybe the most proud of is I'm interested in the inner lives of families and children. And so I try to explore three different views of loss from a child's point of view and three different views of found, how we recover from it, and how personal it is. Because what one person, everyone has a unique relationship with a parent, with a sibling, with a friend. And to think that we're we're all seeing it in the same way. I have two brothers, and the way they see our childhood isn't even the same. Mm. It has commonality, but I'm not sure even the headlines are the same. But I don't know that they should be because you treat every child differently. And as a parent, you think you're doing it the same, but part of that is just because every kid isn't the same. So you're not reacting to the same things. Very true. Some things are easier to accept than others. It's also about parenting. So what's a good parent? What's a bad parent? Is there such a thing? I don't know. My brother and I recently had a talk about like some interpretation of of something that happened and we had like completely opposite. And I'm like, and I'm like, no, 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 this is what happened. And this is what it was like. And he's like, no, 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 this is what happened. And ultimately who, who knows? I mean, I, I don't know. I guess it doesn't really matter, but um, yeah, I guess we all take what we take out of every situation. I don't know. Just, I think it's interesting when I talk to my friends growing up, we remember very different things. So recently I was with sort of my best friend, Amy from childhood and she brought up a couple of things. I have no memory of them at all. And they were very big. She thought they were interesting, fundamental things we did. And I was embarrassed to say, wait, when was that? But then things I remember, they weren't important to her. So maybe that's the key to memory is that you can only remember something if you continue to access it and remember it. Mm. So every memory is a memory of a memory of a memory of a memory. Mm -hmm. And if it's something either that made you uncomfortable or that you chose to not remember again, you somewhat forget it. Mm -hmm. And when someone brings it up, you can remember it. But what happens in remembering and remembering and remembering the photocopy of the memory, which happens over and over and over again, that like any kind of copy, it becomes disintegrated every time it's copied. Yep. And it becomes, in the disintegration, changed. And it becomes changed to fit how you are today, usually, because mm -hmm. we're all the hero of our own lives. And we all want to believe, I think, that we've been making good choices and the right decisions. And so you take your memories and you conform them to be what is your evidence, mm. the evidence of your life, I think. So part of the book is about Lindsay, the main character in Pieces of Blue, looking back, how did she marry the person she married? Why did she marry him? Mm -hmm. What happened in their marriage? There were some things that went wrong. More rain. And, and, and who's who's responsible for that? Yeah. Were they both responsible? Is he more to blame? Is there what is blame? Is that mm -hmm. just a way to make you feel better? Probably. But then what's shame? Is that when you look back and you know that you did something that perhaps was not what you should have done or the right thing to do. And so those are things that I'm, 
I'm very interested in the idea of shame from an adult perspective, because as adults, it's something children feel a lot of. And children, because they are learning boundaries, they will feel ashamed. But it's not something you hear adults say. If they do, they always preface it. So I'm ashamed to admit Mm. when something comes out of that in the same way that if someone says, uh, I have to be truthful, you wonder, well, what were you doing before that? (laughs) Were you up until the point in the conversation? (laughs) Because I have to be truthful is usually when you deliver the punch. Yeah. <laughs> it's the round out. It's the, I have to be truthful. So your yeah. arm is on back and you're getting ready to hit. I don't know what that has to do with my book. Probably nothing, but. <laughs> well, it's just awesome. I, I love how you think all the things through your hilarious sense of humor. I could listen to you just like talk about stuff and watch your mind go. It's really fun. Really Super fun. <laughs> okay, well, I want to tell you this funny thing. So I wrote this book called Short, and it's sort of autobiographical. I saw that. I'm going to get it for my daughter because, you know, I'm 5'2", and all my kids are short, and so uh, they all are annoyed at me about it. <laughs> so uh, I was very short. And in, from kindergarten to seventh grade, I was the shortest girl in the class. and I was the shortest of anyone in the class. And, and I was so short, I looked two years younger than I was. And I have a brother, younger brother. He was my size. People thought we were twins. Nothing worse, by the way. And, uh, and I could hear my parents talk about it because my parents aren't short, but I have a grandmother who's very short. So they were saying, well, she's like her and everything. But the main character, Julia, who is short, she has a ton of personality because she has to make up for the fact that she might be the smallest one. So she has a big voice. And that's something that sometimes what happens. And the book is in her point of view. And you listen to the ramblings of Julia, which are basically the ramblings of me. (laughs) And uh, one of the things she says, she loves to read obituaries. And she says, even when you die, you're still looking for praise. Everyone wants applause. That's what she says. So she says, even... When in the afterlife, all you want is to someone to tell you you've done a good job. And that's a child's perspective, but it's really my idea of the universe, which is we all want validation. We all want to be told we're doing something right, maybe even when we're doing something wrong. But maybe (laughs) except for Vladimir Putin. Maybe he's the only one that doesn't need all the praise. He can deal with the negative attention. Oh, my goodness. Holly, this has been so fun. I can't believe that it's been half an hour. I We have to like keep this up in person another time and in the store and in LA. Actually, I should ask you, I'm doing a screening of uh, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, this Sunday in, in oh. Santa Monica, if you have any interest in coming. I do. At five o'clock. Maybe you can send me the details on that. And I do want to say that I will be traveling for Pieces of Blue. So in Cambridge, I will be at Porter Square Books with Professor Henry Louis Gates. Mm, wow. Uh, in New York, I will be at Barnes & Noble Tribeca with the actor Richard Kind. I will be in Seattle, Washington with Maria Semple, the novelist of mm. Where Did You Get At? I'll be with the poet Ed Skog in Portland, Oregon. I'll be with the novelist Gigi Levanchi in Nashville at Parnassus. Okay. And I'll be in Houston at Blue Willow Books and at Little Shop of Stories in Decatur, Georgia. I'll be everywhere. You'll be everywhere. Maybe people want to come out to a bookstore and hear me talk about Pieces of Blue, which publishes on May 9th. Yay. Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me today. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 